it's Tommy Simpson, and we're talking about Roy Superior. Was his name really Superior, or did he yeah. make that up? No, his name is Superior. It was a joke between the two of us. He said he had the only Jewish mother Superior in America. <laughs> The artist Roy Superior died last summer, and I never got to meet him. But thanks to his friends, colleagues, and former students, and a magnificent show of his work at the Center for Art and Wood, I feel I have gotten to know this brilliant and funny Renaissance man. And with luck, I can share him with you through this film, which I'm dedicating to Mara Superior, herself a brilliant artist, and the light of Roy's life. Okay. Okay. All right. Here we begin the Roy show. This is me in my birthday suit in 1935 <laughs> with my mother and father. You'll never see a pair of buns like that anywhere else. Roy Superior, this magical concept and ideas comes from within him that he translates into wood. They are fantasies that are almost realities. It's like some kind of hidden realm within him surfacing that you don't expect. Did my time in the Army and worked as an illustrator in New York City. And even though I was doing quite well, I really had a yen to paint and found that illustration and painting are two completely different directions. Loved painting out of doors directly from nature. I would try to get out with my pen and ink and brushes every week out in the woods, do these wash drawings. I discovered I had a lot of patience to sit and do patches of woods with 10,000 branches. Some of my heroes and inspirations, Durer, Rembrandt, Degas, Homer, Sargent, a relatively little-known painter, an artist artist named Edwin Dickinson. I was sitting on the sofa one night, half watching television, as I picked up my pen and started drawing. Did you ever see this? Ideal man. Somebody actually bought this at Leslie's Gallery. And they walked in and they paid uh, like two grand for it. I couldn't believe it. I mean, who would want it? But obviously they know their history. <laughs> so when I came back from Italy, you know, there's Leonardo in his self-portrait, kind of eyeballing out of the corner my version of what the ideal man is now. <laughs> I've lost a lot of weight since then, too. <laughs> I can't complain. I can't be apologetic. What you get is what you get, baby. <laughs> Take that, Mr. Genius. Well, a lot of his work is very narrative, and his dad was a dentist, so all the very meticulous work on it, it's probably in his genes. Roy's drawings, with their wonderful complexity, led him to his work with Wood. These are all pen and ink from my imagination. I mean, where you would find stuff like this to look at? And these things, literally, I just pick up my pen and hold on for dear life. They would keep doing themselves. Sometimes they got a little erotic, dripping penises and vaginas and anything else you can think of. It's all there. But I love the texture, what I call color, that I could get out of black and white. These are as much about pattern as they are about images. Started to get writer's cramp, but it was fun. You see these stick images up there? Yeah. All right, that's the first time that these things appeared. It's what led to the first wood things that I did. You see the canvas on the easel is bursting, just about to blow out. Right. And all the, the stick work there. This is called Breakout. I was finally beginning to realize that I could make these things in three dimensions. Roy started out as a painter, as a fine artist, and pursued that as well as teaching it. Somewhere along the line, Tommy Simpson introduced him to working with wood, and he got hooked on that. One day, when my friend Tommy was working, had his wood shop in the basement, he said, let's make a table. I said, I've never done anything except make a canvas stretcher. He said, well, we'll use my tools and buy some wood. No. 
So I made a table, and something snapped, and I borrowed some money from my mother, made her a couple of wooden screens to pair back, and <laughs> moms are so easy. <laughs> The craftsmanship is very meticulous. It's a scale that's almost like a jeweler. There aren't many people who work in that scale with the precision and care about the materials. His work pretty quickly focused in on miniatures as a way of telling a story in a very concise way. He drew heavily on the Renaissance, the inventiveness of that period, the way that individuals who were artists were also engineers and architects, the classic Renaissance man. First thing I did was this little rainmaking machine. It's about seven inches tall, and when you blow on it, the things spin around. I took it outside to photograph it, and it poured for three days. <laughs> He took great joy in the wonderful silliness of human endeavors. The human condition, when you turn the cranks, everything makes a big flap. The wings go up and down. The weather vane things up on top spin around. The only problem is that it'll never get off the ground because it's chained to real life, which is what that rock says on it. patent model for a good life. Good intentions and technology do not an angel make. Uh, the metal says humor. When you turn the crank, the wings flap up and down, and these are all factors in living a good life. Honesty, etc., etc. And somewhere along the line, he decided that the shaker lifestyle was a pretty fruitful target because they were people who were so dedicated to simplicity and non-technology, not buying into the grid, as it were. They had to be inventive because the rest of the world was screaming away from them with the electric motors and gas engines. They became sort of an easy target for him to consider what kinds of ways that they might adapt their lifestyle to a more contemporary time. The shakers were celibate, which is why there is no more shakers. Shaker, rocker, shaker, which when you pull open the drawer, it shakes the chair up on top. The chairs are about maybe seven inches tall, made with as much precision as I could get into it. Texas Shaker Dragster, two candle power headlights, dynamically designed with a leather seat, which one would expect. Shaker Nautilus exercise machine, weights are fully adjustable. Shaker snowmobile. Texas Shaker rocker. Notice the guns and the arms. An early doctor's bench based on a Shaker cobbler's bench and you can see some of the 19th and 18th century medical tools. This is called Sawbones. Humor, it's an avenue of acceptance. You know, if you're coming with misfortune in your eyes, people are gonna back off. If you come with humor in your expression, people are gonna to wanna to listen. Good work is his own reward, it is a miniature antique workbench. In the drawer it says, he who cuts his own firewood is twice warm, and that's a rainbow up on top, and underneath is a pot of gold, which I made. I make everything, no found objects for me. Pots made out of copper, brass, the vice actually works. He uses all sorts of woods, and some of them because of their color, and some are what they call elastic modulus that can bend and still have strength. And some have a lot of character, like figured maple or tiger maple or fiddleback. The shaker ones have tapes, what they used to call shaker tapes, but they wove the seats of the shaker chairs. Jack Laramore pointed out to me that Roy often used a variety of techniques in the same piece to add aesthetic richness. In his workbench, he uses a rustic log cabin technique next to exquisite miniature dovetailing. 
pattern model for the first snowblower. The shovels go around, throw the snow up in the air, and the bellows blow it away. Now, I had this in a show at the Armory, that big crash show, which is a bust. Towards the end of the show, an older man comes up and says, Wouldn't that throw the snow in your face? <laughs> and I said, Well, no, I don't think so. At which point I decided that was probably the last show of its kind I would ever want to do. <laughs> Roy also created various shrines to food, especially Italian food. The Olive Museum, collection of the world's most bizarre olives. You got the world's longest olive, it's the world's largest olive, a very extremely rare bearded olive, a petrified olive, a green and black speckled olive, world's squarest olive, the world's most erotic olive. This is a self-portrait card from an olive pit. Two-headed olive, world's oldest olive, world's roundest, world's flattest, an albino freckled olive, German olive, double olive, a Greek olive, and they're carrying martinis. World's smallest olive, underneath a magnifying glass, and a twisted olive. Some of the things inside there, you got the uh, patroness of the museum, olive oil, oil, based on John Singer Sargent's portrait of Madame X. So that's Madame Oil, and that's uh, Da Vinci's olive pitting machine, which actually does work. Usually, if, if you're an artist, no matter what you th are thinking, your activity of your life is towards the positive. You're constructing something for the future. It's like planting a tree. You don't plant it for you, you plant it for your children, because they're the ones that are going to see the tree and take advantage of it. It's sort of in the nature of his teaching. Roy was a much better teacher than I was, because he related to the process of education, giving that way. It was an audience for him, as well as a sounding board. So I taught with Roy at uh, UArts for 13 years. I've learned a lot of things from Roy. I was pretty new to the teaching world when I came on. So in a lot of ways, he was a mentor to me in terms of teaching. His former students would all be, to the person, absolutely dedicated to him because he developed community and he cared about it. At the end of each semester, we would have a party for our department. All the wood majors would come and we would spend hours developing awards so that everybody in the class got an award. And there was always some absolutely insane poetic tagline that went with the award. It was hysterical, but it had the effect on the students of understanding that we cared about them. That was not lost on the students. They really got that. At the memorial, it became very clear that Roy's students truly loved him. You were a student of Roy's. What was he like as a teacher? He was quirky and funny and endearing and sweet. Infinitely sweet, yes. Roy was both teaching us about art and also about life and loving life. He related to his students in a way that just doesn't come along every, every day. Mara Superior, way beyond Roy's wife, I would say the center of Roy's world. He was so devoted to her and they collaborated on work a fair bit. Mara is an extremely accomplished, world-renowned ceramicist. They enjoyed a lot of the same imagery and worked back and forth within their collaborations. Mara is a wonderful cook, world-class porcelain artist, cover girl on American Craft Magazine, we always do what she wants me to do. <laughs> but I think that more importantly, they really collaborated on life, continually looking for ways to live life to the fullest. They traveled a fair bit. These are drawings and paintings from Italy, the most inspiring place in the world. These are Chianini bulls which are raised solely for the purpose of bistec alla Fiorentina, which, if you've never had it, is the most delicious steak in the world. They're a lot of fun to be with. Music was always a part of their life. I have been toying with traditional jazz since high school. I'm a rabid, rabid, devoted fan, and it is my true passion. And I used to play a lot 
but I don't so much anymore since the clarinet is so heavy <laughs> I can't lift it. <laughs> Among Roy's passions, and he had many, he was a skilled musician, a connoisseur, could talk forever about cigars and would hold court outside of the University Arch with some of the students and show them how exactly to trim the cigar and get it lit and the proper way to hold it and smoke it. And he was a completely dedicated fly fisherman and he ended up scheduling his life around fishing. I was fortunate that I got to spend some time with him in the month before he died. He was telling me that he pretty much had it figured out, going to be cremated, and he had given instructions to Mara. He wanted to have his ashes distributed on this very secret, finest fishing hole that he had ever come across, which seemed very romantic and beautiful and so forth. The follow-up line was so that the other guy that he took there fishing would never be able to fish there again because the ashes would ruin it. <laughs> A reporter came out to interview me and looked around the studio and said, and wherever he goes, Mr. Superior carries his seed pods with him. I should have kept my mouth shut, <laughs> my fingers crossed. I first heard that quote from Joseph Albers, who said in his own German accent, genius lights its own fire. <laughs> Never forgot that. And no one who sees Roy Superior's show is likely to ever forget that either.